Disclaimers. One, as I say, these are not recommendations. These are things that I am buying now. We all get that? This doesn't mean they work for you. It means they work for me. Uh, the other thing is that I have been trained in public speaking to always give the audience what they want. Always. And what this market wants is an excuse to sell things, not to buy them. So I'm going to tell you about three stocks, and I'm going to give you three or four reasons each why you shouldn't buy them. Right? I'm going to give the audience what they want. And then maybe having made you sick, I'll make you well. And then it'll be your decision as to whether you want to buy them or not. The first one is Ivan Platts. How many people here know Ivan Platts? Let me give you the overview. 19 years as a private company, run by a guy named Robert Friedland. Think what you will about Robert Friedland, positively or negatively. He is the most successful mining entrepreneur on the planet since the Oppenheimer family. Four reasons not to own it. The first reason not to own it is that the company operates in two jurisdictions that people hate, South Africa and Congo. When you could invest in friendly jurisdictions like British Columbia or Nevada, why on earth would you send your money to South Africa or Congo? The second is that the company is spending $20 million a month. $20 million a month. How on earth will they ever recover the $20 million a month that they're spending? Why in this market would you ever buy a company that was spending $20 million a month? I'm doing pretty good so far, right? I've made everybody pretty sick. Uh, to get to heaven with Ivan Platts, to get into production, is going to take five or six years. This is a market that has apoplexy holding a stock over a long weekend. Uh, who in their right mind would own a stock where it is five or six years away from heaven? And finally, to get to heaven, to put three, three mines in production with attendant processing facilities is going to cost seven billion dollars. For seven billion dollars, you could probably buy the whole TSXV with left, room left over for another TSXV. So why on earth would you buy a company that was operating in an inhospitable place where they're spending twenty million dollars a month where you don't get to heaven for five or six years and where it's going to take six or seven billion dollars to get to heaven i hope i've discouraged you all sufficiently from ivan platts so why am i doing this the third best project in the company there are three projects is Kapushi. Kapushi is a project that I've known about and been around for 20 years. It is very simply, although it's the third best project in Ivanhoe, the single best zinc copper deposit in the world. In other words, the worst property in this company is the best property of its type on the planet. Period. Full stop. Bar none. Simple declarative statement. The Kamoa copper project in Congo is the most important copper discovery in the world in the last 40 years. The Katanga copper belt, the thing which gives us Kapushi, Kolwesi, Tengifungarumi, is the best copper belt on the planet. It has been explored by a hundred years by the simple mechanism of walking along it and in the places where the oxidized copper outcropped and was green, in other words where people found copper on surface, they started digging holes. Robert Friedland looked at the western extension of the uh, Katanga copper belt where it was under sand and it didn't outcrop and said, do you think the copper cares whether it's covered with sand or not? And with that simple expedient began to drill and found a copper deposit where the surface expression is about the same as the real estate covered by the city of London. Uh, the largest undeveloped copper deposit on the planet, the best copper discovery in 40 years. The other deposit is the Platte Reef deposit in South Africa, which is simply the most important platinum and palladium discovery on the planet since Norilsk 80 years ago. So in one company, you have two absolutely world-class company-making discoveries. The third property, the throwaway property, if you will, is only the best of class in the world. The company has a market capitalization of $1.2 billion dollars. There's about $300 million in cash in the company, arguably going away fairly quickly, but $300 million cash, meaning current enterprise value is $900 million. 
for $900 million, you get the best salesman I have ever met in my life. Uh, in fact, on my very, very, very best day, if Robert had pneumonia, he would do better than I would do after three cups of coffee. He's astonishing. And beyond that, he's the most successful mining entrepreneur on the planet. The best for a hundred years. If these sound like a lot of adjectives and a lot of hyperbole, it's because they are all true. If you look at those, this guy's track record, Fairbanks, been in production 15 years, still in production. Voises Bay, Turquoise Hill, you know, Oyo Tolgoy. World-class discoveries from one guy, and he has two new ones in one vehicle. Astonishing. That $900 million in enterprise value, let me relate it to real value. Jokmek, which is an arm of the Japanese government, paid $200 million for 10% of the flat reef deposit in Ivanhoe. If 10% is worth $200 million, the big deposit is arguably worth $20 uh, $2 billion, right? I mean, that's sort of simple math. It's worthy to note that they paid the $200 million two years ago when the deposit was half its present size. But let's assume that it hadn't grown by half. Let's assume it is what it was. That means that Friedland's 90% of the deposit is worth $1.8 billion. But it's valued at $900 million, and you get the best copper discovery in 40 years and the best copper zinc deposit in the world for free. Free is a very, very, very good number. Now, for those of you who care about market structure, I'm not one. There's one more reason not to buy it. The last time I looked, there was 1.2 million shares looking to be bought, a million of them from me, 200,000 from the world, and there were 41 million shares looking to be sold. So certainly in the near term, there is a preponderance of sellers over the buyers. My counterpoint to that is that I don't care much about the near term. Uh, if I have the ability to buy what I suspect is $15 billion worth of assets for $900 million, and I have the willingness, which I do, to own it for three or four years, my idea of a good time. Second one is Lydian. Let's do three reasons not to own Lydian. Right? Remember, you give the audience what they want, and this audience is looking for an excuse to sell, so I'll give it to you. The project is in Armenia. Uh, Armenia doesn't have mining laws. Most people who know about gold and silver can't spell Armenia. And in addition to being in Armenia, it's in a part of Armenia in the far south with some fairly unsavory neighbors. People like Iraq. Uh, so it's in a bad part of what is ostensibly a bad place. Second reason why not to buy it. They're in feasibility stage, and everybody knows they're going to need to raise equity to put the thing in production. Nobody knows at what price, and nobody knows when. So there is, uh, if you will, resistance in the market associated with the timing of the next equity raise. The third reason why not to own it is because the management team associated with Lydian are explorationists. They have no particular expertise in mine building. And you have this, this situation where you have a geologist who might mistakenly mistake himself for an engineer and cost you a lot of money. These are all problems. Why buy it in that case? Why on earth would you buy it in that case? Because the feasibility study at Lydian shows it from my point of view to be worth $4.50 a share. And I can buy just the shady side of a $5 bill for a dollar and a half. If I was walking down Cordova Street here and somebody said, I'll give you $5 for those six quarters, the correct answer is yes. This is a project with a plus 30% internal rate of re return, a payback of three years or less, very, very, very high, high, high capital efficiency. With regards to the risks associated with Armenia, I am sympathetic. My experience has been, however, that political risk is ubiquitous. It's not confined to places that we can't spell. Had the people in this room voted differently three weeks ago, we would have a very, very, very different assessment of BC political risk as an example. I would draw your minds back eight years ago or nine years ago to the period in time when natural gas prices were high and the province of Alberta Alberta Stan, if you will, that bastion of free enterprise, doubled the natural gas royalty after having stolen $3 billion in exploration rents with exploration companies predicated on a royalty system that they obviated. 
The truth is that the most dangerous politicians that you will ever face are those who are closest to you. I would submit to you that the political risks in Armenia are less than the political risks in either British Columbia or California simply because Armenia needs mining and richer jurisdictions do not. I realize that's an unpopular point of view, but it's one that served me very, very, very well over time. As to the question with regard to the management team and that project, what I really take heart in is that the company's president, Tim Coughlin, has told me on several occasions, Rick, one of your risks is that I don't know a damn thing about milding a mine and you're going to need to replace me. One of the things I like about myself is if somebody asks me a question about technology or in fact any investment related to natural resources, I tell them I have no earthly idea. And I think one of my strengths as an investor is I stay away from what I don't know. And Tim Coughlin has described as a risk to me and a risk to him the fact that if they build this thing, if they don't get taken over, he's going to have to fire himself. That very self-understanding, from my point of view, obviates some of the risks associated with Lydian. Finally, and this is really crass, but I'm going to do it anyway. The third stock I want to talk to you about, and I, I could give you a whole bunch of reasons why not to own this one. I mean, I could give you a catalog of reasons because I know it so well. The third one is a place I work, Sprout Inc. Why would you want to buy a place where the thought leaders, Mark Faber, John Embry, Eric Sprott, Rick Rule, are 71 years old, 70 years old, 68 years old, and 60 years respectively. I mean, Christ, the leadership is dying. <laughs> Literally, not physically. You know, in a human resources business where all of your nameplate human resources are about to go out feet first, uh, why would you do that? And the business is unusually dependent on natural resources, 100%. Why would you buy a money manager in a sector that's degrading? I mean, truly degrading. And the investment performance associated with the part of this business that people think about has been pathetic. It hasn't been bad. It's been pathetic. I mean, the Sprott FundServe business in natural resources has been astonishingly bad. I mean, it's been good by comparison to others, but you don't make money in comparison. You make money absolutely. I, mean, I could go on and on and on. I mean, the stock has gone from ten cent, from ten dollars to three dollars. Like you're supposed to buy stocks that go up, not down, right? Uh, why on earth? And oh, by the way, this is funny too. I read a research report a couple days ago by one of the Canadian chartered banks. I hadn't thought about this as a risk, but I guess they say it's a risk. Uh, the bank says that because Sprott is in the financial services business and doesn't have any debt on their balance sheet, that we're inefficient capital allocators. From their point of view, we should be like them uh, and have 92% of our assets represented by debt. Uh, that's sufficient, I guess. Anyway, so the reasons why you wouldn't want to own us is because we're in the resource business and because we're old and because we're inefficient allocators of capital and because we have a shitty track record. Pretty compelling case, right? So let's examine that. There are 200 people in Sprott, not four. And I can tell you from personal experience that our bench strength is unbelievable. There are four people at the top who get the credit and there are 196 people below us who make us look good. And we are doing everything we possibly can to surface these people in terms of reputation and any other way. Anybody in this room not get Sprott's thoughts? Our e-letter? E get it. Get it. You get the best ideas from Sprott three times a week, and by the end of June, you're going to get them five times a week, and you're going to get them free. Now, make no mistake, in return for getting this stuff for free, we're going to occasionally propagandize you about paying for some of our services. But that's up to you as to terms of whether you do it. So first of all, with regards to the risk about the old guys dying, we're going to. As you can see, I have a little strength left. And while I'm around, I'm going to do my level best, which will work at surfacing the talent below the top four. How about the resources sector? The resources sector is cyclical. Anybody who's been in the business for 10 years or more knows that it's cyclical. It is interesting to note that at a point in time when things are on sale, people who have been for 30 years regarded as very, very, very good bargain shoppers are selling for 30% of what they were selling for when the market was less attractive. 
as for the fact that we have a la lazy balance sheet, we make no excuses for that. Our thesis at Sprott is that the hubris of the large financial institutions, and in fact the hubris of governments, believing that they can operate either societies or banks with no equity, um, is the author of the set of circumstances that we're involved in today. I would agree with you, probably, that the people who run Hong Kong Shanghai Bank or the people who run, run J.P. Morgan Chase are smarter than Eric Sprott and Rick Rule. I just don't think that they're enough smarter than us that they can run their business with a 5% equity slice relative to us running our business for a 100% equity slice. At Sprott, we are eat our own cooking, and part of our own cooking says you are going to be solvent. Uh, you are going to be solvent. And as for the poor recent performance, I think you need to put that in context. Uh, Eric Sprott's 20-year track record prior to 2011 was so good to be almost arithmetically impossible. 20 years plus at 20 years plus net of fees compounded over time. What has happened in the last two years is that we have been wrong, simply wrong. We made a bet. Some of you shared in that bet with us, and we were wrong. But I don't suspect, and I don't suspect that you suspect, that we are wrong over time. When we come back, I suspect that we will come back very well. And the other thing is that the fund serve business, the public Canadian mutual fund business, that has suffered the worst in terms of performance, now constitutes 30% of the assets of Sprott, which is to say that the business unit that comes in for all of the criticism 10 years ago was 100% of Sprott, and now it's 30% of Sprott. The other 70% of Sprott is permanent products, the physical trusts, my business, which are seven to 10-year partnerships, uh, the lending business, and Sprott Resource Corps. And oh, by the way, despite the fact that we are at or near a market bottom, Sprott is still a very, very, very substantial cash generator. And that cash is unburdened by the debt that plagues so many of our competitors. I was able three weeks ago, and I did this for fun, uh, I was addressing uh, a group of brokers from a very large brokerage company and some of their clients. And the presentation went fairly well. It was odd. At the beginning of the presentation, you could see from the body language that the stockbrokers in the group were terrified. But after about five minutes, I was completely unapologetic about resources. I was really charging. In about five minutes, you could see the investors in the audience picking up. The stockbrokers, being the predators that they are, uh, got very, very, very excited about this. And the meeting took on the sort of aspects of black church. It was almost call and response. It was a lot of fun. And at the end of the meeting, just for fun, I wasn't actually trying to accomplish anything, I compared and contrasted two investments, one riskless, one risky. The riskless one, of course, was the U U.S. 10-year Treasury, and the risky one was Sprott Inc. And I tried to make the case that Sprott Inc. was, in fact, less risky than the U.S. 10-year Treasury. Obviously, our balance sheet's a little bit better than the U.S. government's, but our ability to generate cash is also better than the U.S. government's. So I tried to make the point. So which one is really riskier? Uh, a 10-year unse uh, unsecured obligation of what is by conventional gap measures, an insolvent issuer that yields 1.75%, uh, or a business that's regarded as a thought leader, generates substantial free cash, is debt free, and pays you 4%. The choice is fairly clear. And so I'll leave you with that on Sprott. How much time do I have left? I have 10 more minutes. So I've given you three. Uh, I'm going to give you two more, just for laughs. I'm not going to follow the old format, which I did to amuse myself, which is tell you why not to buy it as opposed to tell you why to buy it. I'm just going to tell you why to buy the next two, and then we'll probably have some time for Q&A too. Uh, the first is one that I manage, the Sprott Physical Platinum and Palladium Trust. Uh, how many people here haven't heard my Platinum and Palladium thesis? Okay, well, simply put, uh, Platinum has all the attributes of any other kind of bullion, except it's better. Gold and silver, I think, should go up, but platinum and palladium, I think, must go up because of supply and demand. There is almost no above-ground supply of platinum, unlike gold or silver. So the only supply you need to concern yourself with is new mine supply or recycling supply. And that supply is very constrained because platinum and palladium only come from three countries, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Russia. The global platinum and palladium industry does not earn their cost of capital. Because they don't earn their cost of capital, 
they can't pay wage increases, which they must pay. They can't pay increased taxes, which they must pay. And they can't fund sustaining capital investments, which they can't fund. This isn't something that's going to occur two years from now or three years from now. Platinum production in South Africa has fallen by 19 percent in six years. This isn't something that's going to happen. It's something that has happened. At today's platinum and palladium prices, the world runs out of platinum and palladium. It's that simple. The price must go up. And importantly, it can go up because the utility associated with platinum and palladium to its users is very high. The political trade-off is platinum or smog. On a global basis, there is incredible pressure for higher, not lower, air quality standards. And the air quality standards that we enjoy today are a consequence of the application of only $200 worth of platinum and palladium per vehicle. If the price of platinum and palladium were to double, in other words, if the incremental cost of platinum and palladium on a per vehicle basis went up by $200, how much impact would that have on the demand for a $28,000 car? My suggestion is none. Hence, price must go up. Price can go up. If price must go up and can go up, price will go up. What could go wrong with a thesis? 2008 style liquidity collapse where automo automobile demand falls apart. That is your real risk. If that happens, your shareholdings in Sprott Physical Platinum and Palladium will be the least of your concerns. The least of your concerns. The trust is also unique in another way. Well, it's unique in two ways. It trades at a discount to the spot price of platinum and palladium. The market has assumed that the management offered up by myself and Sprott is worth minus $3.5 million a year. Hardly flattering, uh, but a bargain for you all. If you went to buy physical platinum or palladium from a dealer, you would pay spot plus three and a half or spot plus five. And with the Sprott brand, you get to buy it at a discount of 1.2. Uh, further, for American buyers, Sprott Physical Platinum and Palladium is tax efficient. If American buyers buy either the ETF or if they buy the physical, and if my thesis is correct and they make money, they pay tax at the collectible or ordinary income tax rate. If they buy physical, Sprott Physical Platinum and Palladium Trust because it's structured as a trust, they pay tax at the capital gains rate. I don't know your feelings for the U.S. government, but I think it's practical and patriotic to pay the bastards less. And I suspect over time that tax efficiency will work itself back into a premium in this market, and I also think that the prices of platinum and palladium will go up. Finally, one more, talking my book again. Uh, Toscana Energy, TEI, and the Toronto Stock Exchange. Very, very high quality people. Uh, at Sprott, we competed with the Toscana people for years and years and years and we found it unpleasant. Uh, we liked them, they liked us, and so we bought them. We don't compete with each other anymore. Uh, the Toscana people are high quality people. They have an oil company, Toscana Energy Income, trading on the Toronto Stock Exchange, that's selling at almost a 20% discount to net asset value and yielding a sustainable 11%. This is not something that's gonna give you a 10 for one return. I don't know about you, but I have a substantial amount of my own portfolio that's looking for income. And the idea right now of parking it in a bank at 75 basis points, you're not taking a risk here, by the way, that's a guaranteed loss, a certified guaranteed loss. You're certain to lose money. As opposed to buying well-run assets at a discount that yield me 11%, from my point of view, the choice is fairly clear. Put all your money in this? Of course not. But for that money where you're willing to take a chance and you don't believe energy prices are going to fall apart, certainly 11% uh, at a discount to NAV run by a decent team is, from my point of view, a very, very, very actionable uh, idea at this point in time. So that's it. I promised you three ideas. I gave you five ideas. The first three ideas, I gave you four reasons each why not to buy them. I hope you ignored that part of the discussion. And I have five minutes left to answer questions. That was pretty efficient, sir. Energy fuels. I'm not an owner of energy fuels. I like the uranium space, but I like companies with the ability to operate larger mines. Love the uranium, don't love that idea. Other people? I'm going to have to thank and excuse you, sir. Stand up and speak loudly, please. Uh, can somebody help me with... 
Ah, 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 ah. Disclosure of additional conflicts of interest is what you meant to say. <laughs> I have conflicts of interest in Cameco, uh, you know, which is simply put the only name in uranium that you have to own. Uh, I own a lot of Uranium Participation Corp. I believe that the uranium price is going to go up, and the fact that I can own uranium, which I think is going to go up at a discount, without exposing myself to all the operational risks of mining, is something that really, really, really appeals to me. With more speculative money, I own fission. Uh, I think the new discovery of fission and alpha, while it's far from certain, is very, very, very attractive. I own Denison. I've done business with the Lundin family my entire professional career. And doing business with them again in a commodity that I love is my idea of a good time. And finally, I own lots of a little junior called Rockgate that has a 25 million cash in the till and a 23 million market cap and what is now a 30, million, a 30 million pound deposit that I hope becomes a 50 million ounce deposit. Those of you who care about strange places should note that it's in Mali, uh, so it might not be suitable for people with a different view of political risk than mine. Other questions? Somebody on this side that I can see? Yes, ma'am. The, the lady and asked the symbol for Lydian, which is LYD on the Toronto Stock Exchange. If you have the ability, because Lydian trades in London, Australia, and Canada, you're often wise to price compare between markets with Lydian. Sir? Strategic metals. I'm no longer a shareholder of strategic. It gave me everything I wanted. Uh, I mean, strategic and attack were you know, it was Christmas twice in one package. It was truly spectacular. Uh, strategic has now varied from the prospect generator business model with all that cash to sole risk exploration. And using my money for exploration as opposed to using somebody else's money for exploration is not my idea of a good time. In the exploration business, I like the prospect generators, the prospect generators, and the prospect generators. And, uh, you know, they have, they're what I would call recidivist generators. I like the people. They made me a boatload of money, and they're high-quality technical people, but their business plan doesn't get my money. Sir? Attack exceeded every level of greed I had. I mean, we financed them at a dime, save the company check. We financed them at 35 cents. We wrote another save the company check at 25 cents. We saved them twice, and the stock went to $10. I mean, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> With simple math. Yes, sir. Um, there isn't the equivalent to silver wheat in the gold market. I own a lot of Franco Nevada and I own a lot of royal gold. They are selling at premiums to their net asset value, as is silver wheaten. Their costs of capital as a consequence of that are sub-zero. What is changing in the royalty and streaming business was the deal silver wheaten just did with Vale. Uh, what the industry has figured out is that base metals companies trade at five and a half or six times EBITDA, and the royalty companies trade at 17 times EBITDA. The royalty companies can overpay for precious metal streams from base metals companies, and in the odd calculus of mining math, it becomes accretive. What it does for the royalty companies is it gives them stable, stable 20-year revenue streams that they couldn't get from smaller precious metals deposit high visibility of cash flow, and the ability to do incremental dividend increases. What it does for the base metals, mining, base metals companies is lower their cost of capital dramatically. And people don't understand this in the royalty and streaming model. This is a sea change. You will see transactions in the last next year and a half, if the market stays low, involving the very biggest base metals companies doing multi-billion dollar royalty and streaming deals uh, with the precious metals cash flows from their deposits, which will be mutually beneficial to both sides. So despite the fact that they're overpriced, oddly, I own them because I think they're going up. Sir? Sandstorm. Sandstorm, uh, Sandstorm treated me well. I no longer own it. I think they're at a competitive disadvantage to the larger royalty companies because the larger royalty companies have higher quality royalty streams and lower costs of capital. I like Nolan a lot, and if the stock sells off, the idea that I could buy that young team at a discount to NAV would be highly attractive to me. But for right now, I think he's operating at a competitive disadvantage to the old guys. Sir? 
Sir? I can't, I can't hear you. Pumpkin Hollow, do not know. Nevada Copper, okay, I do know. Um, I don't know really enough about that deposit to comment, but when I look at the copper space, I have to um, benchmark the developmental stage copper producers against Freeport MacMoran, which is trading at five times EBITDA, and the idea that I'm going to pay seven times EBITDA for a prospective deposit that isn't in production, when I can buy uh, enterprise value to EBITDA at Freeport at five times, it makes it very, very, very difficult. We only own three copper names other than the producers right now. It's, I mean, the benchmark is ugly. Sir. What do I think of Colorado Resources? What this market really needed was a big Canadian discovery, grassroots discovery, that I owned the hell out of. And they got the first one, but they missed the second one. <laughs> I think it's tremendous. Uh, I didn't see it because I don't fund soil risk exploration. I think the whole spectacular, I think it's great for the industry. I think it's nice that an honest, competent team got lucky as opposed to some other kind of team. I think it's spectacular. I think it's tragic that I didn't own 20% of it with warrants. Uh, sir. Uh, New Strike Capital is owned by the Lundines. I don't fund solar risk exploration. If New Strike got to the point where it was selling at 20% of tangible book, in other words, if I could supply them capital, enough capital to answer the unanswered question at a substantial discount to all the schmucks who came before me with a full warrant, uh, which I fully suspect in this market I'll be able to do, although maybe not in that name, uh, the idea that Lucas would let me fund him at an 80% discount to the price that he paid, his wallet relative to mine, that seems unlikely. But I would do it in that set of circumstances. It's just unlikely. Ladies and gentlemen, I really, really, really want to thank you for the time and attention that you've paid me. Before you, before you go away, uh, there's something I have for you for free, which is Sprott's Thoughts. Free is a very, very, very good price. I have to get off stage because somebody has to follow me. I'll be at a booth right next door if you have any more questions. Thank you for your time and attention. I hope I make as opposed to cost you money. I hope you pay attention to the reasons why not to buy these stocks, and I hope you disregard them. Thank you.